TV thing kind of happened by accident. So I always approach weather from the science part first, the TV part kind of like, uh, that's kind of like the icing on the cake. I get to share what I've been doing all day with the people at home. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the math, some of the things we do in weather. I want to leave enough time for questions. So if you guys have questions about, you know, how do we do this or how, how, do, you, how do you get to the point where you're issuing seven-day forecast, ten-day forecast, um, et cetera, I'm going to leave time for that. Um, I, get questions, I get questions about where I buy my pie, you know, about the shows on NBC. I hear them all. Normally, normally the little kids, I do school talks for, for like elementary, they all want to know how much money I make and <laughs> what kind of car I drive. And, uh, you know, if I've ever, you know, been in a tornado, which I have, I chased tornadoes for two years, so that's a whole other subject matter. But uh, you can ask me about that if you want to as well. But the main reason I'm here today is talk about meteorology and math. And um, a couple of the basics I'm going to go over here are going to be observations, numerical modeling, data collection, and interpretation, conversion, and forecasting. And you're probably asking, why is forecasting at the bottom? Well, before I even get to the forecasting part, there's a whole bunch of stuff you have to go through. And one of the interesting things about my job is because I'm on TV, people see that two minutes and 30 seconds during 6 o'clock news. That's just like the smallest little segment of my day. It's like the icing on the cake. It's the easiest part of my job, believe it or not. The hardest part is getting to that point at 6.17 or 11.18 or 5.15 or 5.45, depending on when you watch. Um, around all night, 4 to 6 and then you know, 11 o'clock. But getting to that point of forecasting the weather is is the, really the hard part of my job. And it starts early in the morning looking at a lot of information. I'm going to talk about how we get that information, some of the, the math that goes into it, some of the equations. Um, I'll, I'll throw only one equation out today, I promise, just one. Um, because if this was a real meteorology course, it would be a ton of math. Because my degree is actually in meteorology. We call it atmospheric science at Ohio State. To get to that point, you had to take all the prerequisites you need for an engineering major. So you took up to calculus three and then differential equations. Um, so I took more math in college than I took all of high school. And it was amazing. Just so you know, I didn't like math until I got to high school. I hated math. But once I figured out there was a way to figure out the weather using it, I started to like a lot more. Just goes to show you once, you, once you have a good use for it, it becomes a lot more enjoyable. So first thing, observations. This is surface observations. What I mean by observations, we're talking about weather stations collecting weather information from the surface first. This is this morning's map of all surface observations in the United States that were plotted at one time. Now there's probably about 8,000 uh, what we call official weather stations. These are airports, um, like you know, Hickory's got one, Lenore's got one, Statesville. But there's also supplemental data. You have your personal weather station. If you're really hardcore to this, if you get a personal weather station, you can put it online. You can actually help supplement the data. Uh, we call those MADIS or co-op observers. That information will help get fed in to the models as well. So this information is important for calculating future weather and knowing what's going on present. So that's the surface observation. Very, very important. But one thing that people always forget about when they watch the weather, it's not all down here at the ground. There's a lot of stuff going on above our heads. Uh, the, the, the troposphere is where all the weather happens. And you know that, that could be from, depending on the time of year or the setup of the answer, that's from down at the ground up to 40, 50, 60,000 feet, it fluctuates all the time. It's not a static thing. Stratosphere level lowers and goes up all the time based on the temperature. If you want to go to the shallowest part of the atmosphere, it's in the North and South Pole. That's why the ozone hole is so important in those parts of the world, because the atmosphere is very narrow. The colder the air is, the thinner the atmosphere. And, that, and we'll talk more about why that's important as well. But weather balloons are vitally important. This is a weather balloon. We still launch these twice a day all over the world. And this is inside what we call the uh, sounding building. We call these soundings because they're going to take an atmospheric profile uh, once they're launched. That's a hydrogen-filled latex balloon. It's attached to a cord, has an orange thing on it, that's a parachute. And then that white box, that's called the radio song. There's an instrument in there that basically will transmit the dew point, relative humidity, temperature, pressure, and then based on the movement of the whole thing, it'll give us a wind speed and direction. There's actually a big tracking antenna on the top of this building here that will track that all the way up. And it will go from the ground all the way up to sometimes 180, 190,000 feet. It will go to the edge of space before it bursts. Um, but when it gets up to that altitude, because of the loss of pressure, it starts expanding. It's huge. And it starts flattening out. And when it gets huge and starts flattening out, it starts getting like flying something there. And that's why airline pilots will always 
see these and think they see flying saucers. Um, because they, they will get up. That thing's meant to stretch. It'll be as big as that building at one point before it breaks. And you can see he's about to launch it. They roll open the door, and there's the balloon. And that big, looks like orange trash bag, that's the parachute. You can see the radio sign hanging from his right hand there, right here. That's actually about a $700 piece of equipment. And you can't see it here, but there's actually prepaid postage on that. If you find that in your yard, you throw it in the mailbox, it gets sent back, and then they'll recycle it. And they get about 60 or 70% of them back, believe it or not. Um, it's a land in farmer's fields, and people will find them. Um, and that will save the government about three or $400 to recycle it. If not, every day, morning and night, 700 bucks goes down the drain all over the, all over the world. And that's it's launch. So you can see there's the balloon, there's the parachute, and there's the radio sign. And the time from launch to burst could be two hours. The whole time it's sending data back. Now, I, I, I have a good friend that works for the National Weather Service, and one of the cool things they do, they have these running like uh, chart where they all try to see who can get the balloon to go to the high before it breaks. And so they'll have like the record book of like, it burst at 190 or 180. And so that, that's your goal every day is to try to get high. And depending on turbulence or, or the jet stream or how thick the atmosphere is, they may burst at 60,000 feet. Sometimes they burst right away and then you get, you get garbage data. Sometimes it goes way up. And if it gets up to a certain altitude, um, you know, it may hang up there for a while. Just think about, we all think it's going to go up to the jet stream and get taken off. But once it gets past the jet stream, you get up towards the stratosphere, there's no wind at all. It'll just sit up there in like kind of meander. So in the jet stream, we'll take it long distances, but then it will go through the jet stream and then it will hover. Um, so what you'll see a lot of times, you'll see the thing go up uh, the map. It'll go up and get blown east with the jet stream, and then it'll get above the jet stream, and it'll just sit there and kind of meander around for a while. But the upper air stations aren't spread out nearly as much as the surface stations because it's expensive. I would love for us to launch weather balloons all over the country three or four times a day. Now, if there's severe weather, sometimes they'll do a special sounding, they'll launch a balloon. If they think there's going to be severe weather today, let's say in um, Amarillo or uh, out in Oklahoma City or up in uh, Goodland, Kansas, they will launch a special sounding at 1 or 2 in the afternoon to get a good sampling of the atmosphere. So those are the only upper air stations. And that's the United States. We're launched all over the world, though. It's 0Z and 12Z, which is Zulu time. Uh, now that we're on daylight saving time, that's actually 8 and 8. So it's 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. every night. Um, they're launched. But how do we supplement that data? There's big holes. Well, mine is the freezing level, 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you get up to this red, that's minus 20 Celsius. That's really cold. You're getting super cool water at that, at that altitude. And what's super cool water? It's water that's occurring below the freezing level. You can have water actually exist below freezing if the pressure is low enough. And what happens in super cool water, super cool water is kind of neat because as soon as it touches a solid object, it crystallizes instantly. Uh, this is how Rhyme Ice forms. Ever been in the mountains, see all the top of the mountains all covered in ice when a cloud blows by? That's super cool water droplets in the cloud freezing out the trees instantly. We call them Rhyme Ice. That was the grandfather mountain all the time. So up here, you'll get that super cool water, and that super cool water will start hitting other things and they'll freeze into ice pellets. Eventually, that ice pellet gets blown up to the top, sinks down to the bottom, will uh, get wet, get blown back up, freeze again. That's how the hail process starts. And depending on how strong this updraft is, the hail will get bigger and bigger. Until it's so big that that updraft's not strong enough to hold it up, the gravity just takes over. So if you, can, you can actually directly measure how strong that updraft is by the size of the hail piece. Pea-sized hail, 60 to 70 mile an hour updraft. Baseball, 150 mile an hour. So you can actually calculate pretty easily. And our software, our, our, our software and software radar will, do, will run algorithms to tell us this information. So think of the calculations that are going on in this, this instance. The radar is telling me the freezing heights. I know what's going on at the surface. I'm plugging in surface data. The computer is then going to analyze, run an algorithm, a hail algorithm to tell me, okay, the hail should be this size at 10,000 feet, but it's going to melt a little on the way down. And it should be this size by the time it hits the ground. So we can get a really rough estimation of how big the hail is. You can get cool looking shots like this cross section. This is a storm, this is the uh, Dallas, Texas tornado, but two weeks ago now I guess it is. Remember that weather balloon was going up. If it's going up, it's going to make a line. This is the temperature profile of the atmosphere. This is the dew point temperature with height. And you can see here these are in, in tens of thousands of feet. And then over here is the wind speed and direction. So 
this was actually from this morning, um, 11C from the NAM model for Charlotte. And you can see we had a huge inversion, which is kind of cool to look at. It was just above 10 degrees Celsius, about 11 at the ground. And what I mean by inversion, if you go up to maybe 1,000 feet, it was actually almost 5 degrees warmer. So, and that's typical in the morning. Cold air settles down near the ground, there's a warm layer, and then it gets cold again. That's what we call an inversion. Those inversions cause fog, they cause high ozone days in the summer, they trap everything below. You've probably seen this, you've seen smokestacks in the morning, smoke goes off, hits something, goes like that. That's an inversion. 